I put a video together about the shocking violence towards elderly Australians in these nursing homes. What you're about to see is is really disgusting and shocking and I don't want to say too much about it because I'm just going to get upset about it. What I want to say is I want you to note the terms that the media used. I put together Channel 7, Channel 9, ABC. Some of the people involved, they put hidden cameras in some of the rooms, which was really good. But what I want you to take note of, as well as the other information, is the nebulous terms that the corporate media uses, such as chemical restraint and physical restraint. Now these terms are really very nebulous in the sense that when you're talking about, when they're talking about chemical restraint, they're talking about forced government drugging. Chemical restraint is giving drugs to, in this context, the elderly. Nebulous terms such as chemical restraint, physical restraint. Chemical restraint is, first of all, restraint is forced and chemical meaning uh, government drugging. Chemical meaning drugging, so pharmaceutical drugging, psychiatric drugging or general medical drugging. Well, the general practitioners, practitioners can prescribe psychiatric drugs. Now, so what they've done, this evidence shows, this is hardcore evidence showing that the politicians have given funding to organisations, private organisations running nursing homes to enforce forced government drugging and physical violence. When they talk about physical restraint, they're talking about forced again, and they're talking about physical violence. So the terms used by the corporate media are very nebulous. They don't really explain exactly what has happened. Uh, what the government has been funding. The politicians have been giving them billions of dollars to do this, these private organisations. And I know that they've got elections rigged. They're putting prefix numbers in the computers. I'm certain of it. They think that we can't get rid of them. The public can't get rid of them, but we have to demand they be jailed. I want to refer to a report again, which I've made a video about before, which was published in 2017 by the Australian Bureau of Statistics under the psychiatric system. This includes the general practitioners as well who are enforcing government drugging, forced government drugging. Um, in that period they published 75,858 Australians had died under the government psychiatric system. In a 13 and a half month period they have an age, an age configuration. Persons aged 15 to 74 years, 26,375 people which means the people that died outside of that age bracket under 15 or over 74 years, 49,483 Australians. That's just over the 13 and a half month period. So this is hardcore evidence that the police can act on. They need to talk to the Australian Bureau of Statistics about the forced government drugging of the population. And in particular, the elderly who are incredibly vulnerable just by their status. And you've got, we've got hardcore evidence now of this violence, this disgusting, gratuitous violence that has been forced upon the elderly in Australia through the forced government drugging and physical violence, shocking acts of physical violence and forced government drugging, which is incredibly violent because they kill, they kill people with these drugs. I've been speaking out about this for over seven years. And the politician interviewed in the video that you're about to watch, a federal liberal politician, Ken Wyatt, is nothing but platitudes and excuses for what they've been doing. These people have to be jailed. They're so dangerous. They actively use the law, public money, and an army of government workers to kill Australians in a variety of ways. And these organizations, the directors of these organizations, the directors of these organizations have to be jailed and the politicians and yeah, it's just totally criminal what they've been doing and the senior government involved as well. It's completely criminal what they've been doing using this incredible amount of violence 
towards the public and especially the vulnerable, the elderly, the homeless, um, single parents, anyone that's poor, anyone that's vulnerable, um, you know, they just get they just get so violently treated. The police have to act. I also want to refer to um, the public needs to the public needs to encourage the police to act and also contact the Australian Electoral Commission to email them and tell them to take these political criminals off the ballot. They have to be deregistered and removed and banned from going on ballots. That's Liberal, Labor, the Greens and Nationals who have been funding and um, funding this disgusting violence towards the elderly. I also want to refer to the amount that they spend on aged care, which is about $21.5 billion in the um, what they published, the 2018-19 budget. That's what they say, not that we can believe what they say, but let's just say that figure is reasonably accurate, $21.5 billion out of about a $85 billion health budget. They are just actively giving this money, billions of dollars to these organizations and these company directors and these drug, disgusting, violent drug pushers to drug the vulnerable in the, in the so-called health system. And that money should be given under, in my political website, I've got elderly rights in, in an Australian Bill of Rights in the list. And I've also got a separate federal elderly rights fund for the elderly. All of that money, $21.5 billion, should be given to the elderly people themselves. That money should be given to the elderly people as on top of what they're spending themselves towards their own retirement, their own um, elderly care, because what they're spending themselves is probably three times as much as the federal budget plus that 21 billion, that should all be given to the elderly people once they hit 65 years and they can pay for their own care and their own care at home. If they want to stay at home, they can have pay to have someone visit every day or some sort of contact every day. If they're at home, they can buy medical equipment. They can have a visitor. Uh, they can have, um, you know, other services provided, food provided, and uh, whatever their needs are to be provided and delivered at home if they want to stay at home, rather go into these disgusting places where they get badly treated and the family members don't visit them and they get drugged. All the evidence showing is that once they enter those places, they die very quickly and they get so badly treated. It's so horrible what has been happening. It is just disgusting. I said I didn't want to talk about it too much because I'm going to get upset, but it's really shocking, you know, what what you're about to see. And also what I've been told over the years by people out there, uh, by Australians, you know, about how their elderly mothers and fathers and relatives are being treated you know they stop they stop the siblings they stop the children from seeing their parents um, in these places and it's just disgusting what's been going on this is all politically driven this is wiping out the vulnerable because they don't vote for them and they're importing their electorate which they've been doing for 200 years in Australia importing their electorate bringing in foreigners to vote for them and uh, getting rid of our people. Replacement, what I call replacement democide. So the police have to act, have to encourage the electoral commission to remove them from the ballot, they're banned from the ballot and deregister their parties and encourage the police, federal and state police to go and jail these politicians and put patriots in our parliaments. That's federal and state parliaments. Because how can they kill thousands, hundreds of thousands of Australians? How can they kill our own people? Look at all the Aboriginal people they've murdered. And now they're killing off Australians of European descent. A lot of these elderly people that go in there, they are of European descent. It's, it's absolutely horrifying what's happening in Australia. Absolutely. It just boggles the mind. And it seems that, how can we stop it? We have to have them removed and jailed. The public has to do it in some way if the police won't do it. We need to work out how to remove these people and get patriots in our parliaments, just put them in.
not by election because they've got elections rigged. And it is so serious that, you know, even these corporate media people are reporting on their stuff, but they're making millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars out of their political connection with Liberal and Labor. They've been taking their money as well through the government funding they use when they advertise or when they make government announcements. They've been taking hundreds of millions of dollars and that's why they're still broadcasting them in elections. But they've definitely got prefix numbers put in the computers because within an hour after the close of poll between six and seven, bang, Liberal Labor, Liberal Labor, it's prefixed. And what, how long have they been doing that for? For decades, probably. And then what you see in an election is just a show because the numbers aren't even being put in the computer by the staff. But yet supposedly there's a result. And if you analyze the published figures on um, the published election figures for May 2019, all the first preference votes for the small parties means about a third of the politicians in the Senate must be new parties and independents based on the mathematical numbers. And that hasn't happened. So it's definitely rigged and we have to have them arrested. We have to have them removed. But I hope this, what is what put together, um, gives you an insight into how disgusting and violent and criminal the political people are in this country, the corporate directors and the, and the senior government and the senior government involved in profiting and enforcing all this disgusting violence towards the elderly. Queensland again, but uh, not the most pleasant of stories. Elderly residents of the Earl Haven nursing home on the Gold Coast were being physically abused and chemically restrained in troubling numbers. For more on this story, we go live to Julia Bradley. Julia, the revelations came about during a Royal Commission hearing. That's right, Annalise. The Aged Care Royal Commission hearing in Brisbane has heard that about half of the elderly residents at the Earl Haven nursing home had to be physically restrained and about 71% uh, had to be chemically restrained. They were given a psychotropic medication all before this forced shutdown that saw 69 elderly residents forcibly evacuated from the facility. These revelations came about from a staff member at the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission who had actually visited the facility on June the 25th, uh, just a month prior to that forced evacuation. It was all down to a contract dispute between the owners of the facility and the subcontractors. Now, uh, the executive director of that uh, commission says these figures are extremely uh, troubling and concerning. Uh, the course of action now is going to be for that commission to find out a bit more information about uh, these restraints and to then come up with a, a course of action uh, in terms of regulation. Uh, we are expected to hear uh, more comments on Earl Haven at about 1 p.m., I'm being told. We've already heard some uh, shocking revelations from a staff member that feared she'd be punched in the face uh, during that forced evacuation uh, and these uh, concerns for levels of restraints only making matters worse for Earl Haven. An emotional daughter has given heartbreaking evidence at the Royal Commission into aged care. She's told of how a six-week stay at a Marylands nursing home left her 72-year-old father a broken man. Wiping away tears, Michelle McCullough describes watching her father disappear to a shadow of the man she once knew. Awful. Awful. Terry Reeves, who has dementia, spent two months at Garden View Aged Care in Marylands. His short stay led to a long line of questioning at the Royal Commission. I suspected that he had been given something. He had his head drooped, he was drooling. When he moved in, the 72-year-old was able to go to the toilet himself. Within weeks, Michelle witnessed six nurses hold him down after he wet himself. There was a lot of yelling and screaming and Dad saw me and tried to... He got an arm free and grabbed hold of my arm and he started saying, no, no, stop it. Um, it was very traumatic for him and for me. Documents tendered as evidence reveal Mr Reeves was restrained for up to 14 hours a day during his stay at Garden View. But the main nurse responsible for caring for him had very little memory of that time. I do not believe I did the ticks. I do not recall anything. 
An email to staff directed carers not to put restrained patients in the central dining room as it doesn't look nice when visitors walk in and see residents being restrained. I would like restraints, um, both physical and chemical, to be completely abolished. It's gone. Kate Creedon, Nine News. The family of a man with dementia has told the Royal Commission into Aged Care he was physically and chemically restrained for up to 14 hours a day while staying at a Sydney residential home. His wife and daughters say he left the home a changed man. This is Terry Reeves before he went into Garden View Nursing Home in Marylands in Sydney's West in May last year. This is what he looked like a few weeks later. The 72-year-old's family had put him into respite care while wife Lillian went on a holiday. They say he was soon being physically restrained with a lap belt for up to 14 hours a day and they suspect chemically restrained with antipsychotics. He had his head in his chest, eyes closed, drooling. He was shivering. He only had a singlet on. Um, it was quite cold that day and it was all wet with saliva. While the family gave consent for physical restraints to be used, they were assured belts and straps would only be used for very short periods when necessary for his own safety. They also found out he'd been prescribed the antipsychotic Rixidone. We did become suspicious that he was being given something due to his increased drowsiness and his, uh, he started to drool, just become a little more incoherent. A registered nurse from Garden View said that physical restraints were part of the nursing home's practice. Yeah, our policy is restraints only applied when it's the last resort and everything's been tried. And when it's applied, it's checked hourly and recorded. And then every two hourly, it's released. The third round of hearings in the Royal Commission continue in Sydney on Wednesday, focusing on how residents with dementia are cared for. Caroline Marcus, Sky News, Sydney. An explosive report into Australia's aged care has revealed appalling conditions in some of our nursing homes that are leaving vulnerable residents at risk. The research shows thousands of elderly Australians are being fed meals costing just $6 a day as facilities look to cut costs. Tracy Vo is following the story. Tracy, doctors say it's a national disgrace. Yeah, not a surprising response at all, Michael. Prisoners and pets are being better fed than people in some aged care homes. Just $6 per resident, that's $2 a meal. The AMA president says more money is spent on his guinea pig's food. It's also less than what jails spend on feeding prisoners. The study shows aged care facilities have cut their food bills by 30 cents per resident. This this is an industry that is booming, raking in $1 billion in profit last financial year. There are now calls for the industry to do better. Jakin's family is reeling after her grandparents' nursing home experience in Perth's northern suburbs. There was just cost cutting at absolutely every corner. Her granddad died two years ago. Her nana passed away last month. She was anemic and malnourished. The family says the nursing home failed to provide basic needs, including nutrition. Three quarters of a sandwich, so three triangle pieces of sandwich and tin soup every single night for three years. The Perth family is not alone. Uh, what is that? That's what I'm looking forward to. I'm not happy about it. The financial records of 817 aged care providers looking after more than 64,000 residents exposed in the new study. Three meals a day, a total average cost of just $6.08. Despite making millions in profits, last year carers cut spending on food by 30 cents per resident. The way big businesses are profiting from the despair and misery of our grandparents is a national disgrace. Even prison cuisine costs more, an average $8.25 per inmate. We're spending more on nutrition supplements, like nutrition drinks, where residents, it's, we're really wanting to advocate for a, a whole food approach. Do you want to try it? Not really, no. <laughs> The industry says most nursing homes are doing the right thing. Meals recommended by dietitians and checked. They're subjected to at least one unannounced, and I say at least, unannounced visit from the quality agency to check and ensure that the uh, operator is complying with the quality standards. But the AMA says it's shocked. 
And this report has shown that we need to do better when it comes to the meals that are provided residents of aged care facilities. Well, they've paid taxes their whole lives. Um, they should be treated with respect and that's, that, that's just not being treated with respect. It's terrible. Michelle McCullough was a regular visitor while her father was in respite at a Sydney nursing home last year. Terry Reeves had dementia and it was his first time in care. On the first day, he said to my sister, as they sat down and had a cup of coffee, it's a lovely place, but I'm just not ready for this yet. Which was heartbreaking. Are you going to have another swim, mate? I'll get another apple. Yeah. Terry was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 64. Seven years on, the disease had progressed, though he still functioned well. Terry was living here at Garden View Nursing Home in Maryland's Western Sydney. <sighs> Getting tired? Yeah, I, I suppose I am. Four days after his daughter took this video, she was shocked to find her father tied to a chair in his room. He was left in a room by himself, tied into a chair. Why, well, it's... You wouldn't tie your dog up and leave them like that, let alone an elderly man. The home later obtained consent from the family to restrain Terry if he was a danger to himself or others. But Michelle claims it was used too often and for too long. In one 24-hour period, he spent a total of 14 hours restrained. You all right, bud? Every single day there was a family member there and every single day he was in a restraint. Other residents were also restrained. And he's shuffling along with the chair. She was so distressed by this man, she filmed him. Was anyone disturbed by this? No, everyone just behaved as if it was normal. Well, it, it's, it's a breach of his human rights. We showed the video to the Queensland public advocate, Mary Burgess, who says, because there's no regulation on restraints in aged care, a nursing home can use them when and how it wants. We know there are people who have challenging behaviours and it's in their interests and the interests of others around them to be managing that. But you can't have these things um, operating in, in a legal vacuum. If this was happening to anyone who wasn't part of the um, aged, uh, the aged population in a nursing home, um, it would be regarded as criminal. Michelle believes her father was also given antipsychotic medication as a chemical restraint. That day we couldn't even get him to wake, couldn't get him to look at us, nothing. That was the day that we asked them to see his medical charts and they showed us it and said, see, we've given him nothing. When we checked out and took him home on the last day, my mother received a bill in the mail from the chemist, which had three boxes in total containing 180 antipsychotic medications. Garden View Nursing Home said those drugs weren't all used and Terry Reeves was given antipsychotics on just six occasions. It said it's changed its policy on physical restraints and we regret that these improvements were not in place when Terry Reeves was a resident. Michelle McCullough asked for her father's records but was told she needed a subpoena. Hello, Mr. Charles. Professor Henry Brodati is Australia's foremost authority on dementia. Although nursing homes need consent from families or guardians to give antipsychotics, he says that rarely happens. We did a survey of nursing homes oh, over a decade ago. And we found only 6.5% of people who'd been started on antipsychotics in nurse, or any psychotropic in nursing home had written consent in their file. Another 65 there would be verbal consent uh, documented. Do you think that GPs are also being pressured into prescribing antipsychotics and sedatives? Oh, very often. Uh, the nurse will ring up and say, Mrs Smith is being agitated, she's going to other people's rooms, she's screaming all night, uh, can you give her something? 
And of course, that's the easiest thing to do, to give her something. 84-year-old Margaret Barton was given drugs for agitation at two nursing homes on Victoria's Mornington Peninsula. At the first, Craig Care Mornington, the doctor prescribed a sedative, oxazepam, to be given by staff as needed. Three weeks on, he tripled the drug, a dosage later described as excessive. She just seemed to be completely out of it. We just thought that this was about the uh, advancing dementia. Um, you know, as, as lay people, we don't know a lot about these things. Margaret's husband, Harold, wanted to visit her daily. So a month after being in Craig Care, he moved her to nearby Mequacare Park Hill. When she was transferred, she arrived with instructions to be given oxazepam three times a day, plus extra as needed. Over the next 10 days, Margaret had seven falls. Um, she was given drugs and because of the drugs, she lost her balance and she got a bruising of her black eye and um, broken pelvis. In fact, terrible conditions really there. When I finally got the call that she'd been admitted to uh, Frankston Hospital um, and I went to uh, see her, um, I just, it was just utterly unbelievable because she just looked like, um, you know, skin and bones. And they said, oh no, look, you know, she'll be okay. You can go home. So I traveled the two and a half hours uh, back home again, um, only to get a, a phone call the next morning that she died. <laughs> And I wasn't there. I wasn't. I wasn't there, and she. And she wasn't. She was by herself. No one was with her. The coroner found the 84-year-old died of pneumonia caused by rib and pelvic fractures, and that the medication regime contributed to her physical decline and death. Margaret Barton died after being in care for just over eight weeks. In a statement to the ABC, Craig Care and Mequacare said staff gave medications as prescribed by the doctor and they have since improved their processes. These specialists say the use of physical and chemical restraints should be top of the agenda for the Royal Commission. There's some fantastic practices happening in nursing homes now, and they should be models of what other nursing homes can do. And they're not doing it with extra cost. They're doing it with change of attitude, a change of practice. Australia is one of the few um, modern Western countries to still not have any framework for the use of these practices in aged care. And we know from the research that the use of restrictive practices on older people actually causes them harm, psychological and potentially other physical harms. Hi Dad. Mm. Hello. Mm. He went in as a man who could feed himself, who could take himself to the bathroom, who could engage in a conversation, to come out and, and be a man who couldn't feed himself, needed assistance walking, couldn't take himself to the bathroom lost all of that. Do you think that's just part of the dementia? Not that quickly. It just seems to me utterly bizarre that how mum can go into a, uh, a nursing home being quite reasonably healthy but suffering from dementia and we expected her to live for quite a number of years uh, later um, and yet to find that uh, in, in eight weeks time she's dead. And uh, you know, you just can't help feeling that the system killed mum. Uh, there's got to be better alternatives. These carers think it's funny when Jean Robbins lashes out after one of them grabs her sore leg. Shocked, very disgusted, upset. You could see her face that she was mad at them for laughing at her. No, there was no respect. And we just noticed more and more where 
you know, they were abusing them, and that's what I call it as abuse. Ed Robbins discovered the most disturbing treatment happened at night when his mother was being put to bed. And then even in one part, our mum has a teddy and they threw the teddy in her face. Mum's trying to defend herself there, putting her arm up, pushing against her because she's being grabbed. Robbins is going to see his mother at this nursing home, Morrison Lodge in Perth. Jean Robbins has lived here for the past 10 years. In 2016, Ed was worried about unexplained bruising on her arms and legs. That's your favourite one, isn't it? The Mum said to my sister, you know, look, they're so rough, it feels like they're ripping my skin off. And she actually had skin tears. And you could see the handprints. So she went and asked them and they said, oh, she seems to be falling out of bed a lot. And we kind of thought, oh, well, that's probably because she thinks that she can still, she wants to go to the toilet or whatever, you know. So she'd just try and get out of bed. So I said, well, look, so it make life easy, why don't we just put a camera in, you know, a little camera, clock camera, and we'll just see what's happening. Three weeks after putting the hidden camera in, Ed Robbins discovered what was causing the bruises. And we noticed that she's trying to get out of bed rather than falling out of bed. Jean Robbins had recently broken her leg and was bedridden. But with the onset of dementia, she's forgotten she can't walk. The footage shows the 92-year-old repeatedly calling for help. It takes 20 minutes for staff to put her back to bed. So they've come in and they're putting her back in the bed and they're picking her up by the arms. So you can see the, the hand bruising from her being picked up where they're supposed to use a hoist to pick up any resident off the, off the ground if they're on the ground. That wasn't happening. On another occasion, the carers are using a hoist but because Jean isn't used to it, she's unsure what to do. So mum's hanging on for dear life onto those onto those handles and you can see by her knuckles they're white so she's squeezed because she's scared and they're not relaxing her you know what i mean yeah <laughs> these people's a carer and they're talking to a 92 year old woman don't give us a hard time doesn't make any sense does it these carers think it's funny when jean robbins lashes out after one of them grabs her sore leg disgusted, upset. You could see her face that she was mad at them for laughing at her, you know. There was no respect. And we just noticed more and more where, you know, they were abusing them and that's what I call it as abuse. Ed Robbins discovered the most disturbing treatment happened at night when his mother was being put to bed. 
And then even in one part, our mum has a teddy and they threw the teddy in her face. Mum's trying to defend herself there, putting her arm up, pushing against it because she's being grabbed. The more Ed Robbins watched, the angrier he became. We saw them, you know, dragging Mum on the ground. She's grabbed hold of the woman's arm because she thought she's going to slip. And you can see the carer pull her arm away. Mum was in pain, obviously, putting her hands up to protect herself, and they're throwing her leg in. And the thing was that the, the leg that had been pinned is the one that they're throwing in. She's crying, so they've thrown the pillow over her face to shut her up or to block out the noise or whatever. Putting a pillow over an aged person's head, what is she thinking? What's Mum thinking? Disgusted, angry. A grown man like me. Upset. So. And then having to show the rest of the family. Unbelievable. Yeah. Ed Robbins took the footage to Morrison Lodge, who called Perth Police. Carers Lewis Ando Freeman and Glenda Lua were charged with a total of 12 counts of assault. The case went to court in March this year. So when it went to there, we thought, well, it's going to happen. We're finally going to get it off. Even the police officers that were involved, they said, this will be, this will be it. It'll be all cleared up. And then it all turned to crap. The carers were acquitted of all charges. The magistrate found the carers were run off their feet and Jean Robbins was often violent and abusive towards staff. He found the degree of force used was reasonable. Perhaps if I were to give a, a quick example, the example that I give is the placing of a two-year-old or a three-year-old into a car seat and trying to get their seatbelt done up. If that child is compliant, then some force is needed, but not much. If the child is resisting, then more force is needed. If the child is throwing a complete tantrum, then obviously extra force is needed to achieve what has to be achieved. She's a grown woman, a two-year-old, chucking a tantrum. A child will chuck a tantrum too if they're being squeezed or pinched or, or abused at getting into the bed. How can two or three year old? What would you call it if it wasn't assault? What would you call it? Okay, abuse. She was being abused. There's different types of abuse. She was being physically abused in our eyes and from what we were told by the police. The magistrate awarded costs to the two carers who had been sacked. They think that we are a bad person, but in this situation, we are the victim here and terminating us at work. That's not fair because we work hard. We care for all the people. <laughs> After the regulator, the Australian Aged Care Quality Agency, 
saw the hidden footage, it sanctioned the home and stopped government funding for new residents for three months. Since then, the home's 100% accreditation rating has been restored. Today, people looking at reports on the agency website will find no information about what occurred there. Jean Robbins remains at Morrison Lodge with the camera in place. You know, there should be cameras in every room as far as I'm concerned so that us as families can review things. You know, I mean, it'll even work for the nursing homes, you know, to see what's happening after hours. I don't think many Australians know what goes on treating the elderly. Something like this, hopefully, people will realise and start believing their parents in aged care institutions that something is going on and not just say, oh, it's dementia, your mum's got dementia, and look at it further, you know what I mean? At the trial, carer Lewis Ando Freeman said the only formal training she'd had was a six-week course and that she had five minutes to get each resident to bed at night. Global Care Group told Four Corners it does not tolerate abuse and there is no time limit to prepare residents for bed. Staff who contacted the ABC identified poor training as one factor in what the industry calls rough handling. Rough handling to me can be as simple as rushing a resident. Um, if you've got a resident that's got dementia um, and isn't understanding that you're, you know, undressing them to give them a shower. Um, you can't just be ripping their clothes off here, there and everywhere. They resist, they'll fight you. Um, and it's rough. I always wished that there was, when, when they employed people, they would not just look to see if they've got the certificate, but would actually look to see how do they speak to residents, how they speak to carers, um, what's their grasp of English like. There were some people that were clearly not suited to working in a care capacity. They were um, lacking in empathy and seemed unable to imagine what it would be like to be in the situation of a dependent, frail person. Steve Wood is a former police officer who worked in aged care complaints and compliance during a decade with the Federal Department of Health. Recently retired, he's speaking out now because he believes aged care providers are being protected instead of the elderly residents in their care. Being in the compliance team, we were that thin line of public servants who actually stood up for residents to make sure the providers did the right thing. There seems to be this philosophy now or this culture of actually pandering to or looking after providers. So we, 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 we hasten much more slowly to take action against providers and we give them far more scope to fix things, which perhaps should be fixed earlier. Steve Wood is highly critical of the Quality Agency's accreditation system, which last year gave 95% of nursing homes a perfect score. I think that's unrealistic. I think if you believe that that is how our aged care system is operating at the moment, I think that's naive. I don't think it's an accurate reflection of how the industry is. There must be more providers and services out there who are not meeting the standards and who are simply uh, slipping through the, the gaps in the system. And why are they allowed to slip through the gaps? Because we only do, the agency only does the one unannounced visit a year. Uh, the gaps between those visits can be quite frequent. Uh, the complaints people are no longer visiting services like they used to. Um, it's very frustrating for members of the public. Helen Hackett spent eight months searching for the truth about the death of her father, Xenophon Chimarios. He was born in uh, the island of Corfu in Greece. Dad thought it would be a good idea for us to, to come to Australia and give his family a better future. He was a resident at this Sydney nursing home in Bexley, owned by Booper, one of Australia's biggest private aged care providers, 
which also had a 100% accreditation rating from the Quality Agency. In the early hours of April 8, 2016, a nurse rang Helen Hackett to say her father had died. Well, I had seen Dad about three, three days before and he seemed to be fine. My stepmother had seen him the day before that and we thought that he was, he was OK. I mean, he was very sick, but we didn't expect him to die. He was old and he did have a number of complications and so on. So mm -hmm. what did you find so difficult about getting that phone call? Um, the problem was that we were told that the ambulance was called at 12.35 and that the ambulance was cancelled at 1.30. So I couldn't understand how that was happening. Why didn't the ambulance come within a few minutes, 10 minutes at the most, and take Doug to the hospital? Helen Hackett asked Booper for more details and was told that the registered nurse felt she did everything possible to care for your father, that he did not seem distressed at all, and that two nurses had kept a real close supervision on Xenophon, not leaving his side unless they were attending to other residents. I could have really gone away and accepted their comment that my dad died peacefully. I was concerned that there was no one with him. I was concerned that he wasn't given any care uh, at the end. And I wanted to know what really happened. Why, what happened? Helen Hackett requested a recording of the call made to the New South Wales Ambulance. She was shocked by what she heard. Good morning, Ambulance. Oh, hi, Sister Bitha Bexley. I need an ambulance transfer, please. To the emergency department? No, 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 no. I'm not on the emergency line, am I? No. I heard the nurse talking to the ambulance dispatcher. It was fairly... Um, um, she wasn't in any great uh, rush or she wasn't in, in any concern of Dad's situation. Um, um, I could hear my father in the background moaning and she actually said um, she wasn't trying to get... She didn't really want an ambulance straight away. She wanted an ambulance within one to two hours. What's the phone number you're calling from, please? Uh, 9567. What's the rest of the phone number? Nine oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Casual staff in. OK, so we're going from that residence? Yes. And which hospital are we going George to? George Hospital, please. You can hear her father in the background. Uh, based on the patient's condition, in what time frame would you like oh, to Oh, one, two hours, please. Within two hours, is yes, that thing? Yes, within two hours. Helen Hackett's father was found dead one hour and 20 minutes after the phone call. I don't know why she acted in the way she did. The ambulance service told me that there were all ambulances were available on that particular night. Do you think that Helen Hackett was so appalled, she called aged care complaints and spoke to an officer there. She didn't think it was important for her to listen to the to the tape. And I sort of convinced her that it was important and I sent it to her. Her comment was, will an apology do? And I said, no, an apology will not do. You have to do your job and you have to find out what happened and make sure that this doesn't happen again. Six months later, Aged Care Complaints responded with its report. Helen Hackett's father had been alone for more than an hour before he died. The fact is that, my, that the right things were, hadn't been done, were not done for him at his hour of need. Um, and um, these, these were really just total lies. Aged Care Complaints closed the case. It did not visit Booper Bexley during its investigation, nor refer its report to the quality agency. The nursing home retains its 100% accreditation rating. Booper took the nurse off night duty and retrained staff in how to take vital signs. Booper told Four Corners that in its initial response, serious errors of judgment were made and it was sincerely sorry for the inadequate care.
To simply say that staff members have been educated and this won't happen again doesn't give the family of the, of the deceased any comfort at all because it shouldn't have happened in the first place. I believe there are a lot of incidents like this that we don't know about. Um, people, families do not have a way of finding out the truth. You know, he was a loving man. He cared for his family. He worked hard all his life and he didn't deserve this ending. And the worst thing, I suppose, is that he died alone and there was no one there for him. At this Melbourne meeting in June, families and advocates came together to share their stories about shocking treatment in aged care. I don't care who you are and I don't care what your problem is. There is nothing more degrading or humiliating to see someone who can't care for themselves in soiled nappy, caked on faeces, on her legs, in the nappy, on the walker, and on herself. It, an animal doesn't get that disgusting disregard. These people are angry about the aged care complaint system, which they say is useless. It took me four days to tell my father that he, my 90-year-old father, that his wife had been bashed around the head and that is, I had no contact from the complaint team. They vent their frustration at complaints officers seated at the back of the room. How many were made accountable and what was the most serious issue that you found that they were actually penalised for? Give me an example of how you penalised one of these companies. In the past two years, complaints have increased by almost 50%, yet officers rarely go on site to investigate. Out of um, something like 4,700 complaints in 2016, 2017, the annual report says that the officers made 50 site visits. Have I misinterpreted the reading of that? That's correct. What are you doing there? Not every complaint requires a site visit. When Steve Wood worked in the department a decade ago, there were over 3,000 visits in a year. I'm really disappointed that um, we think so little of our residents that the Commissioner's Office send out officers on only 50 visits from the thousands of complaints that they've had. You cannot get that feeling for what an aged care service is doing over the phone. And you can't get that feeling by sending an email to the provider saying we've had a complaint about A, B and C tell us what you're doing. Well, I, look, I think what they do is they look at the um, severity of each incident and those that are of the higher order is where I suspect they visit a site physically. But, but that is many, a very, many, very small but, no, but many of the issues, it? though, can be dealt with through uh, discussions with telephone, correspondence. You think and, that's adequate? Well, that's a judgment that they make. And if people are happy with those outcomes and write and indicate that they're satisfied that the resolution that they were seeking has been met, then I'm not going to challenge uh, that style. One of the fundamental things that is important to all of us... Aged Care home. Minister Ken Wyatt no, recently ever. announced a new commission to improve complaint investigations and regulate new standards. Since July 1, nursing homes are no longer told the date of their accreditation inspection. That reform is to ensure nursing homes do not falsify conditions when accreditation occurs once every three years, something staff say has been a common practice. Accreditation was a farce uh, because they always got notification from two weeks to a month's notification. Staffing levels were increased. The food on the day or the couple of days they were there was, it was wonderful. Activities were increased to a much higher level. You'd need to go and make sure that all the paperwork was up to date so that all the showering charts, the bowel charts, the nutrition charts, the personal care charts, so just quickly tick, 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 make sure that it was all ticked. They don't see, they're not looking. They're just coming in and they're checking the things in the system and it's almost like if they can tick their box, they're out. 
they 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 don't they're not asking the right questions. They're not and staff aren't comfortable to be able to go to accreditation and say, look, this is actually what's going on, for fear of repercussion, for fear of losing the job. We knew when the accreditation team were going to be coming, so for three months prior to that, we had somebody basically filling in all the gaps, like I say, making up blood sugars, backdating wound dressings that hadn't been done. We were told if there were any gaps just to do a squiggle so that it looked like a signature, so that it looked like it had been given without any concern whether that had been given or not. And um, did you have a problem with that? Yeah, definitely. I think all the staff did. Despite the reforms, Steve Wood says until the agency makes public the failures that occur in nursing homes, families will remain in the dark. I think it's a bit of an irony that you can sit on the internet and book yourself a hotel or a car or a flight <clears throat> and you can compare very easily. But in aged care, it's not so easy, not so easy at all. Because what's published on the agency's website is so restricted, you don't get a true feel for how that service is operating. Alana Freeman is still fighting for justice over her mother's death in 2016. I was asked once, how would you feel if your mother had just died of a heart attack? And I said, I would have been upset, I would have been grieving. But that's normal and natural. I said, the way my mother has died is not normal, it is not natural. In July 2016, June Freeman went to Presbyterian Aged Care Westcott in Stockton, New South Wales. She needed help managing her diabetes, but was otherwise independent. Just three days in, the 87-year-old had a bad fall. Despite her pain and pleadings from her daughter, she wasn't sent to hospital until she had another fall a week later. So then I went to the Marta Hospital and that's when they did all the investigations and Turned out that she had a fractured T12 vertebra that she'd been sitting on for eight days. And how much pain had she been in when you saw her? Uh, sorry, excruciating. Yeah, absolutely excruciating pain. I was angry, frustrated, felt very helpless. When June Freeman returned to the home, she was unable to walk and eventually developed pressure wounds, though no one told the family. She would be very uncomfortable and be, you know, saying her bottom was sore all the time. We thought it was a catheter, but it turned out to be a pressure sore. She had them on her heels, her ankles, her elbows, and a large one on her bottom. And when did you find out how bad those pressure sores were? Um, when I saw the medical notes after she died. We found out how bad they were. I saw the photos of them and nothing was said to me when she was in there. And they were that bad that they, she should have been in hospital having treatment for them. They were infected and oozing as well. June Freeman died of sepsis just three and a half months after she first went to the nursing home. The family went to aged care complaints. Ten months later, it reported that the home didn't regularly liaise with the GP, had not sought a wound specialist review, and had left wound care to be mainly completed by carers. The Aged Care Complaints Commission found that it was untrained carers doing mum's wound care. And how do you feel about that? Very angry now. Um, again, if I'd have known that at the time, I would have done more about it. Um, yeah, I think I would have just taken mum somehow to the hospital myself. 
aged care complaints closed the case. It did not visit the nursing home for its investigation, nor refer its report to the quality agency. Three months later, the regulator extended the home's accreditation by an extra nine months for sustained compliance with the standards. It still has its 100% score. Since then, I've looked up uh, what happens in the UK and the US, and there are sites there where you can find out any complaints. There's nothing in Australia for that. And I, I, I just, I don't understand it. If they can do it elsewhere, what's so hard about doing it here? June Freeman's family is suing Presbyterian Aged Care for professional negligence. It's the only way in Australia to have these places accountable is through litigation. They can't be prosecuted. They just seem to be a law under themselves and um, they need to be named and shamed um, and they need to be hit in the, the hip pocket. And if more people would do this, um, then they might think twice about how they look after people. Presbyterian Aged Care apologised to the family. Generous, kind, loving, wonderful wife, brilliant mother. She always said when we were growing up that she said, I never want to end up like these people in the nursing homes, just a vegetable and in those chairs and, and that's what she was. Libby Bryce knows just how hard it is to get to the truth about what goes on behind closed doors. Hello, Jamie, baby. hello. Jamie Thien has shared that experience. Yes, sorry to hear about your mum. Thanks, hon. Come on through. Have you had some lunch? Their mothers, Mary Thien and Helen Ford, both lived at the Poplars on Sydney's North Shore, owned by Estia, one of Australia's biggest publicly listed aged care companies. The Poplars was magnificent. Uh, it was fairly new. I think it was only a couple of years old. Uh, but it was very palatial. It's not cheap. The RAD was $750,000. Uh, and I think I was paying about 2000 a month for accommodation, etc. They thought that price would guarantee good care, but soon noticed something was not right with their mothers. Well, Mum had, like, bruises and, like, bruises on her wrists and black eyes, and whenever, like I, I said something to the staff, they said she, she had had a fall. But she just, she just wasn't right. She wasn't happy. She wasn't OK. She... She just, yeah, as I said, there's a look of fear in her eyes. The only time I got a really bad feeling uh, about my mum, and this was probably 18 months after she'd been in the dementia ward, was when I went to visit her one night with a friend and she was clearly in a terrible state. She was in her room. Uh, she looked like a trapped animal. Her eyes were bloodshot. She was swearing, which my mother never did. She was trying to bite me, scratch me, saying, don't move, don't move. This wasn't dementia. This was clearly a terrified old lady. Staff were also concerned. On August 22nd last year, one of them put a hidden camera in one of the rooms of the dementia unit. The room belonged to an 85-year-old woman with dementia whose identity is protected. Within hours of putting the camera in place, this is what it captured. A warning. The footage is very confronting to watch and hear. <laughs> 
care worker Dana Gray had been working at the Poplars for nearly four years. It looks like it's over when Dana Gray takes the rubbish bag, but it's not. The staff member who had installed the camera took the footage to management who went to the police. The woman in the video was not the only victim. An internal investigation revealed the mothers of Jamie Thean and Libby Bryce had also been abused. I found out that she had been abused because Mary Ann rang me here. Uh, one Friday night, I'm the chief nurse at Estia. I just want you to know that unfortunately your mother has been the victim of abuse at the Poplars. Um, we have notified the Department of Health, uh, the police, the person's been dismissed. I didn't take it too well. Um, shocked, disappointed. Um, yeah, I was, I was just, I, 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 these things don't happen to, I couldn't believe it was happening to me. Also, um, yeah, I saw a look of fear in my mum's face from the, like, I thought it was part of the dementia, but it was actually, she was being abused and it was, she was scared. The comments that she would make to me, with hindsight, I now see she was being tormented and was very, very frightened. Uh, things like, can you hide me or can you take me home or I can't talk to you long because I'll be in trouble. Estia invited Jamie Fian and Libby Bryce to two meetings at the Poplars for families with relatives in the dementia unit. Look, my feeling that came out of all the meetings was it was purely a formality. There was never any sense of deep regret, regret compassion, sympathy for the families, let alone the loved ones that had been abused. It was pretty well, well, it's past. Nothing we can do about the past. We can move on and this is what we're doing. Well, we weren't getting the full story. So we were just told that my, our loved ones were being abused and um, they weren't telling us the truth. And when we when I pushed for them to tell me more, they didn't tell me any more. Unhappy with Estia's response, Libby Bryce went to aged care complaints and discovered the awful truth. The report revealed that a year before the hidden camera was put in place, staff had witnessed Dana Gray abuse other residents, including Libby Bryce's mother but had failed to report the incidents as abuse. It's unbelievable, really, quite unbelievable. Um, clearly, totally lacking in their care of duty, really fell down terribly, terribly badly because the staff didn't feel it was necessary or were too frightened or uncomfortable to report it. So, Terrible. It needs to be really, like, looked into because um, dementia patients, elderly, they're like children. If this was happening to our children, we would be in there and we would be fixing it and solving it. But somehow the elderly get neglected. We told Minister Ken Wyatt about Estia staff's failure to report the abuse. Shouldn't there be some consequences for the nursing home? Well, 
when I have that reach my desk or if it's been referred to the quality agency, the quality agency will deal with it because there are expectations within the standards. And let me tell you, each time the quality agency is involved, they do take their role seriously. The quality agency did visit the poplars seven weeks after the shocking footage merged. Neither it nor the Aged Care Complaints Commission took any action. The Poplars still has its 100% accreditation rating and there is no mention of the assault on the agency's website. Dana Gray was convicted of assault and sentenced to 17 months home detention with a non-parole period of six months. Magistrate Robin Dennis called the abuse cruel, humiliating and violent. Anyone in the community who has a parent or a loved one who is in an aged care facility would be considerably alarmed. What happened is really everyone's worst nightmare. During a decade at the Department of Health, Steve Wood shut down substandard aged care homes. He says now it's the entire complaints and regulatory system which is failing. I think we've had a lot of inquiries over the last 10 years or so into aged care and there's always some sort of media uh, furor. Something happens and something changes and we'll change the name, we'll rebadge, we'll rebrand, we'll bring in some new people, but ultimately things go back to how they were. These families endured the abuse and premature deaths of their loved ones, victims of a system which failed our most vulnerable. There's no penalty, no justice and no accountability, leaving them asking, who cares? I do not believe I did the ticks. I do not recall anything. An email to staff directed carers not to put restrained patients in the central dining room, as it doesn't look nice when visitors walk in and see residents being restrained. I would like restraints, um, both physical and chemical, to be completely abolished. It's gone. 